former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. This is an impressive list of alumni speakers whose shoes are too big for me to fill. We applaud the formation of the Northern African Business Association and the platform it provides for conversation. It is very easy after a couple of such meetings to take for granted how useful such conversations are. These platforms are useful to take stock of our relationships and to deepen our partnership in development. During last year's summit, the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, shared with the audience great strides in the continent's human and social development and the transformative promise of growth. He also called attention to the impediments posed by those who resist change because they benefit from the old, old order of exclusion and they benefit from inter and intrastate conflicts. For the purpose of this year's topic, a continent in transition, let me pick up from where my senior statesman left off. I'll share with you the agenda before us and then invite you to direct your investments in ways that accelerate this transition and most important in ways that ensure an inclusive and sustainable outcome. So what is this transition? There have been a number of episodes of the African transition. First, in the 1960s and 70s, when Africa took the strategic decision to pursue continental integration as a strategy for economic development. Second was in the 1990s, we saw another transition after the end of the Cold War, when Africa took the decision to tackle peace and security challenges of the continent to foster democracy and good governance. The African peer review mechanism would become a powerful instrument and guidebook of governance. The third transition occurred at a, the turn of the millennium when the celebration of the Golden Jubilee of the Organization of African Unity embarked, Africa embarked on a process of stock taking and mapping out a new long-term vision for the continent under Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Agenda 2063 sets out a common set of aspirations. I will highlight three of them. First, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Second, an Africa whose development is people-driven especially relying on the, po the potential offered by its women and youth. Third, Africa as a strong, resilient, and influential player and partner. All three aspirations are linked. The aspiration of a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development requires that governments do a number of things. Three of them are First, we need well-educated citizens and skills revolution underpinned by science, technology, and innovation. That our cities and settlements are modernized and people have access to basic amenities. And thirdly, that African economies are structurally transformed and are able to finance their own development. Developing well-educated citizens means building skills, knowledge, and creative capabilities of Africa's youth. For a continent with about 41% of its population below the age of 15 years and 60% below 25 years, developing the skills and knowledge capacity of Africa's youth is a matter of urgency. If we are to bring more people into the development and governance process, if we are to maximize the, the demographic 
deficit. Let government and business in partnership find ways to invest in quality education because it nurtures creativity and, it, and creativity drives technology and innovation. The quality of the future labor force, the next generation of innovative entrepreneurs and problem solvers rest squarely in the investments we make today in developing the capacity of the youth. The second area of investment opportunities comes from the theme of last year's summit, investing in Africa's cities. According to commentators, urbanization and the growth of cities in Africa may well be the most important transformation that will take place in this century. As Africa becomes increasingly urbanized, one increasingly urbanized, meeting the infrastructure needs of growing cities provides opportunities for investment. Meeting the needs of cities requires the sustained provision of a wide range of urban infrastructural services that underpin both private sector activities and the well-being of the urban population. It is likely, ladies and gentlemen, that we can rely on public investment. It is unlikely that we can rely on public investment alone to meet these needs for two reasons. First, pressing resource constraints means that relying on public investments may undermine fiscal sustainability and macroeconomic stability. Second, the need to manage public investments with greater efficiency calls for a paradigm shift. Private-public partnerships are emerging vehicles of investment in urban infrastructure, such as power generation, transmission and distribution, <laughs> urban water systems, housing and transportation. The conventional social expectations that these must be provided by government alone are giving way to innovative private-public partnerships. To this end, Ghana, for example, is taking steps in developing the framework of PPP, legislation outlining the governance modalities of private-public partnerships is currently underway and is expected to become law by early 2018. Third, managing a continent in transition requires structural transformation of our economies. And the key to this end is how to use technology to innovate production systems from farm to offices and to manufacture. And our transformation handles are in diversifying our economies, strengthening linkages between resource and non-resource sectors between agriculture and industry and through intensive use of technology. Diversification is needed to build stronger economies. We need to leverage our natural resource commodities through value addition in order to make the most of our commodities, expand our capacity for job creation and to make Africa partner in the global, a partner in the global value chains. Well-educated citizens, skillful labor force, and technological innovations are most needed to build Africa's productive capacity. Fourth, agriculture continues to be the most dominant economic activity for most of our active workforce. It continues to be the mainstay of the rural economy. Most farming systems remain traditional, small-scale, rain-fed, and extensive with little application of science and technology, from seeds to fertilizers to post-harvest management and processing. This is not likely to yield the kind of results needed for our transformative agenda. For many oil-producing African countries, even more threatening to agriculture is the Dutch disease. The onset of petroleum production in Nigeria, for example, in the 1960s, 
in Cameroon in the 1970s led to a decline of the agricultural sector of these countries, partly as a result of policy neglect and partly as a result of the shift of labor away from agriculture to the oil producing sector. So despite their vast arable land and despite their potential as food baskets, Cameroon and Nigeria have now become net food importers. In fact, the recent decline in Ghana's agriculture, some observers argue, may be a flashing amber of the Dutch disease problem. We must rethink agriculture for food security, for rural development, for a push into agro-processing. <coughs> Addressing the challenges requires effective state institutions designing and implementing the right policies and rethinking the way we invest in agriculture, whether the investment is coming from the public sector or the private sector. It is for all these reasons that Ghana is launching a Marshall Plan in agriculture as the next step of our flagship policy. The Planting for Food and Jobs launched in April 2017. The goal is to build an integrated agricultural industry, develop a concrete plan to enhance food security, improve farm productivity, strengthen linkages with manufacturing, create jobs and improve rural livelihoods and wealth for Ghanaians. With, with agricultural land constituting nearly 69% of land, the land area of Ghana, Ghana has the land resources human, state, and institutional capacity to step up efforts to ensure improved agricultural productivity and sufficient availability of raw materials for industry. The investment opportunities range from input supply systems to post-harvest management and warehouse and to agro-processing chain for emerging urban supermarkets and food exports. The fifth dimension of the continent in the transition follows directly from the Addis Ababa Tax Initiative launched in 2015 as part of the conversation of financing the Sustainable Development Goals. Africa Agenda 2063 reminds us that the writing is on the wall when it comes to mobilizing resources to finance development. Now than ever before, Africans face the challenge of building their economies, negotiating their transformation, and financing their own development through domestic resource mobilization, trade, and investment. Without this aspiration to have strong, resilient, and people-driven economies, it will be difficult to build strong, a strong platform for economic growth. As economies become more sophisticated and transactions more complicated, the ability to drive to develop the information base that su supports a comprehensive tax system is central to building a strong domestic um, resource mobilization capacity. In the case of Ghana, for example, in the last 10 months, you've had a new government come in with a vision to transform the economy, the transformative agenda. You've seen major strides uh, in the last 10 months. GDP growth at the end of last year was 3.5%, but at the end of this year, we are projecting that we may be around 7.5%. You've restored a lot of investor confidence uh, and FDI flows uh, for the first half of this, this year have reached about 3.1 billion compared to 3.5 billion for the whole of last year and 20 billion for the whole of the period between 2012 and 2016. We've seen as a key and a fundamental to this restoration of confidence and increase in FDI flows the restoration of macroeconomic stability and a vision that has been presented by the government 
to encourage private investment into the economy. We've taken a number of reform measures, um, and fundamental to these reform measures is maintaining fiscal discipline. Uh, and, and we're bringing down the fiscal deficit uh, from 9.4% at the end of last year to 6.3% this year, and we'll move to three, between 3 and 5% next year. As part of the process of making Ghana an investment-friendly country, we've embarked on an ambitious formalization program of the economy. Um, the economy, as in many other African economies, has been largely very informal. And so we've embarked on a major agenda of formalization, and we are leveraging existing technology to formalize the economy. And so there is a digitalization agenda in Ghana that we are um, pursuing. And we say it is digitime in Ghana. First of all, we are issuing national ID cards, biometric national ID cards, to all our citizens and residents in Ghana. And uh, it was launched a few weeks ago, and the mass issuance of biometric national ID cards will start uh, next month. Then we have launched, as at uh, last week, a digital address system in Ghana. And the whole idea is to make sure that you can find addresses and find people. You know, I think that that is very key in formalizing the economy and in doing business and in lending money. You've got to know where people live. And, and so we are essentially using GPS technology and and you know, we've launched a system that is unique in the sense that there's a postcode uh, attached to the GPS uh, positioning as well. Um, and so you can find, uh, and, and it comes, of course, integrated with Google Maps and all mapping applications uh, within your, your telephone app. Once you, you put in the digital address of any part of Ghana, we have 66 billion uh, addresses <laughs> because every five by five meter square of Ghana has now been digitally mapped. You know, so you can find anywhere, even in the middle of a river, you can say this is where I am and we will find you. So we're doing the <laughs> we, we are doing the national ID card, we've done the digital addressing and then we're doing financial inclusion, the payment system um, we're making sure that there's interoperability between the banking system and the mobile uh, payments, the telephone companies, uh, so that the movement of money across the country, regardless of whether you have a bank account or not, becomes seamless uh, across. And so financial inclusion, uh, again, that work has been done and it will be launched next month. You know, so within a period of, 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 of 10 months, We've been able to put together the national ID card, we've gone into digital addressing, we've done the financial inclusion. And then, in terms of the ports, uh, one of the problems we faced coming into office was a lot of corruption at the ports and inefficiency. So we looked at it, did uh, uh, an analysis of what was going on at the port, and we realized that the only way to go was technology. Uh, because you, a lot of, uh, the uh, inertia and, and the inefficiency came from pushing paper, you know, and, and, and the corruption came from pushing paper. So we made the argument that let's go paperless. Let's have a paperless port, let's have a paperless port. It was not an easy exercise because there were a lot of people who resisted that change because <laughs> they were entrenched interest in the paper. Uh, and so we went paperless. We gave an, uh, a direction in May, first week of May, that by the first week of September, Ghana ports will go paperless. Um, people thought it was impossible, uh, but we made it possible. Today, uh, by the first week of September, we went paperless, not without initial hitches, but within four weeks, all the hitches had been resolved, and we, we, the ports are now paperless. And guess what? Suddenly, revenues have increased. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing 
increase in revenue. And I'm not the most popular person at the port right now. <laughs> You know, so I mean, you've, you've seen this major increase in, in revenues, but increase in efficiency. Um, now we can take one or two days to clear your container, and we think that by next year, the maximum should be four hours. That is where the goal, that, the goal that we've set for them. Then, in terms of making the economy business friendly, we went to the Registrar General's department and we said, no. You are also too inefficient. We've got to make you paperless. <laughs> and so the registration of businesses in Ghana, and we launched this last week, has now been moved from this paper base to a paperless system. So right here in Norway, you can sit down here today and register a business in Ghana. You will get your electronic certificate, and you can go and start business in Ghana uh, without stepping foot at the register. General's department. And so, again, all of this has been done within the last 10 months. So, we, we are thinking about transformation and how to make the business uh, uh, environment very, very, very friendly um, to, to be able to, 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 to get people invested. In. So, the focus is, is, is on, on making the business environment friendly, you know, making sure there's government's vision in terms of agriculture industrialization. We really believe that you know, Ghana sh and many Af African countries as well should add value to our raw materials. Having raw materials has been known, we, we have it, but we are not really part of, uh, of, of a significant part of the global value chain. We export raw materials and we have now set a, a vision to do a lot of processing. We want the country to think about value addition and industrialization. And we are encouraging the private sector. We have 216 districts in the country, a lot of raw materials, agricultural products, and so on. So we are saying to everybody, one district, one factory. Think about the private sector. should think about areas that they could add value to raw materials and try to set up factories in all these districts. And, 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 that, and that is very important. Government is also moving ahead with a plan for an integrated aluminum industry. We have a lot of bauxite, over 900 million metric tons. Um, we have a, 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 a smelter, but we don't have an aluminum refinery. So we want to build an aluminum refinery. The 900 million metric tons on its own is probably worth about $50 billion exp exported raw. But if we do, did add value to it, refine it, smelted it, the value would be over $400 billion. So we are saying that just for one resource, it's better to build a complete value chain. And so we are going to set up a bauxite authority, assign all the bauxite rights to that authority, which will then partner with private investors who will come in to, to develop this major resource. Um, but we also believe that you know, regional integration is very important for, for Africa. Uh, and we are very encouraging in that, the free movement of goods and services. One of the reforms that we introduced this year in Ghana is all internal customs barriers in Ghana have been abolished. We've taken them out so that when goods come in from the neighboring countries or wherever, you can have free movement of goods. Uh, it didn't use to be the case. And, and in the area of building our human capital, We've taken a very, very important decision in Ghana because the youth is growing, we need an educated workforce, and so we are implementing a system of free senior secondary school education. Uh, we, this again has been implemented since September, and it is just a demonstration of the importance we are attaching to the quality of the human capital. We want to make sure that the, there is a whole generation that has access to good quality education. I think that is investing for the future. So to sum up, sum up yes, Africa's transition to a transformative and promised growth, to use the words of former President Mbeki, um, is taking place. An integrated and prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development requires a paradigm shift, not only in the way we govern, but also in the agency to develop the capabilities of the citizens. We must invest in the future. 
Our cities are themselves increasingly becoming frontiers for investments, windows of investment opportunities in agriculture, along with the entire production value chain, um, adding value and linking farm to industry, remain widely open. Any um, oil and gas discoveries, um, shipping, um, and so on are, are major opportunities for investors. And so are opportunities in traditional infrastructure, railways, roads, and so on. Even if we have to use the new creative public-private partnerships and join foreign domestic ventures. Partnerships is the way to go. And it's a way, it's a win-win situation for Africans as well as for foreign investors. I think that um, it's inclusive and the vehicles for doing so are the private public partnerships for the most part. I thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you.